welcome again to Public Perspectives. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And here on Old Media, we hear a lot about new media. So tonight, we have as our special guest someone who can speak uh, fluently about that subject. We have Professor Pablo Boskowski from the uh, School of Communications at Northwestern University. Pablo, welcome to the show. It's Thank you very much, Kevin. You Wonderful to um, be here. So you are a professor of media, technology, and communications, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and uh, let's, let's start with the basics. We mm -hmm. hear people talk about new media. Mm -hmm. and. At some point, you know, all media was new. So, uh, <laughs> what do we what are we talking about now when we think about new media? When we think about new media, people oftentimes talk about media that uh, is related to the computer and to computers connected to each other, to networked mm -hmm. computers. So, people oftentimes refer to uh, anything ranging from the World Wide Web to the iPhone and social media like Facebook or Twitter. Uh, media that is online and that is digital and is associated with the computer with computerized devices and that is devices that have sort of embedded computers in them and that allow people to do things that are much more difficult or sometimes impossible to do with the old mm -hmm. traditional media Such as television. Like, like, like television or radio mm -hmm. um, or uh, printed documents but now uh, I'll we hear a lot about the kind of revolution in, in new media. Mm -hmm. And um, as I think we know from studying history, most revolutions mm -hmm. actually don't spring out of nothing. There are antecedents That's correct. to them. So there's some element of evolution in That's this right. as well. So how, how do you see that? How does this new media come out of what's come before it? So then usually, historically, as you said, the new media draws from the existing media, draws practices, draws technology sometimes, and even the people for the most part are sort of mm -hmm. the same, mm -hmm. and then gradually evolve into something new. So there is usually a strong element of continuity, even in the case of very important you know, revolutions, there is always an evolutionary component, and there is always a continuity component within these continuous events. And I, I think we've, we've seen that if you look at um, even the early days of, of the web, that's right. Uh, it was simply a matter of taking a printed article and posting it up on the that's web. That's right. So it, that's that continuity. It's that's right. Old content just displayed in a new exactly, setting. exactly. And it took time to figure out that you could mix print, video, audio, correct, cartoons, correct, and whatever in the new media. Correct. And even today, if you look at the sites of traditional media, like you know, newspapers or television or radio, they tend to have very, very strong elements of continuity, and they are much less revolutionary many times than the sites that are not associated with them. Because the sites that are not associated with them do not have the legacy practices, the legacy people, the legacy technologies, the legacy content that they feel that they have to move on to the web or to move on to the iPad or to move on to the iPhone. So there's no legacy they have to protect either. Exactly. So there's no intellectual property that will be threatened by Correct. building this new. Correct. Uh, in fact, a good example would be the Huffington Post. Correct. Which started as an online mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. news outlet. In fact, it was just Ariana Huffington's personal blog at first. That's correct. And now it's well, just bought uh, for Three hundred million dollars. Yes, American Online bought it. Yes. Um, uh, so, what then is different? I mean, we go from what we now think of as traditional media mm -hmm. um, and into new media, and having having made jumps from oral communication mm -hmm. a millennium ago and, uh, to written communication, mm -hmm. uh, jumping quickly to radio, then to television, mm -hmm. and now to this networked kind of media. Um, each one presents differences, not just in technology and in content, as you said, but in uh, societal effect as well. Correct. So what kinds of things are we going to see with digital media? What, what, let's start initially with just the nature of the content that's being delivered. How do we expect that to be different from what we've seen before? So the nature of the content can be different and sometimes is different in several regards. The first one is the combination of, in many cases, the word, the printed word, with moving images, which is a staple of television, with sound, which is a staple of radio, with interactivity or interactive programs, which is a staple of the computer, mm -hmm. right? So usually in you know, online sites, in online news sites, you have a combination of all of these genres, right? All of these kind of types of communication. So that's one. The other very, very important component that is becoming more and more important as time goes by has to do with the interactive element. That is, in the case of a newspaper, in the case of a radio show, a television program, the participation of the public 
in the content that people see is extremely limited. It's reduced in the case of newspaper to a handful of letters to the editor, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes on television, you know, there are colors, maybe it's one or two, mm -hmm. you know, segment, etc. In the case of online news, if you go to the leading news organizations, CNN, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc. You see hundreds, and sometimes in an article, in a given article, in a given you know, story, thousands of comments, right? Where people sort of express their views, and not only express their views to the news organization, but to the world at large to see, right? And that introduces a very interesting element of participation and many times of accountability, because many times the public also correct errors and does things of that nature. Now, you spent um, a number of months in, in field studies inside right. the New York Times the New York. and the Washington Post, was it? No, the oh, Houston Chronicle, the New York Post. Times, Houston Chronicle, Newark Star Ledger, um, then sites in Argentina, and currently in France, actually. So, having been inside, uh, mm -hmm. how does that feedback cycle work if you ha have a very popular article? Right. and you get a thousand comments on it. Right. How do those comments feed back into the news organization? What effect does that have, if any? It has an effect. Um, it's a very, very interesting topic, and also important topic if we want to understand changes in the news. In the past, journalists were, for the most part, sheltered from this feedback, mm -hmm. right? And they took pride in actually not paying a whole lot of attention to the public taste, but. Mm -hmm telling the public what was important for them, regardless whether the public wanted to read or to see that or not. Um, in, so in that sense, the public was largely invisible or far less visible to the news organization than what is today. Now, today, news organizations have a constant stream of information about what the public is doing with their websites, constantly. There are technologies that allow editors at news organizations to monitor the heartbeat of a site. There is one technology mm -hmm. called Chartbeat mm -hmm. that allows the news organization to monitor, you know, for any given article, how many people are reading that article at that very moment, how many are posting comments on that article, where are the people coming from? Are they coming from, say, a Google search? Are they coming from a Facebook recommendation, etc., mm -hmm. etc.? Et now, confronted with this much larger visibility of the public, Right? The journalist has to make a choice whether it is to continue telling people what people should know according to what the values of the profession is, mm -hmm. or sometimes telling people what they want to know based on what they care about, which is not necessarily what journalists want to write about. Because so, you see, it has been discussed for many, many decades, right, and sometimes centuries, that the news that for the most part we want to read it's not the news that is edifying. Mm -hmm. There's a famous statement by, by a well-known uh, University of Chicago professor in the 1940s, Robert Park, about this matter, that the news that we want to read is not the news that is necessarily edifying, but the news that is interesting. Yes. So if you go to you know, the most popular sites on the internet for news, let's say CNN or Yahoo, go now at this very moment, if we could make this experiment, we would see that among the most viewed or the most popular stories, information that is publicly available to the mm -hmm. public. A fairly large proportion of them would not be about edifying subjects, but would be about subjects that are interesting, even though they are not particularly helpful for people in order for them to become better citizens or to understand society at large. And those subjects have to do with weather, have to do with celebrities, have to do with sports, have to do with crime. So in reputable leading news organizations like CNN or the New York Times, etc. When journalists see this information day in, day out, hour in, hour out, they are confronted with the dilemma of giving people what they ought to know according to the professional to the, mandate, right. the values of the profession, right. right, and the needs of society, or giving people what people want. And this is a major dilemma that I think uh, will be one of the central avenues in which the future of journalism and the role of media in society will be decided. Now, if we come back to uh, the political, for, branch to the political for a moment, uh, the foundation of democracy, as often said, is yes. a well-informed voting public. Correct. Um, and without that, uh, then democracy itself tends to fail because people cannot make informed decisions. Correct. So I if we think about this, um, that dilemma is right at the heart of what you've just described. Yes. The other side of that, though, the, the constant criticism, particularly from the, the, the right 
uh, on the political spectrum, is that the news is controlled by these elites who are trying to decide what's right for Americans. Right. And then, in fact, Americans ought to be able, or, and I'm sure you could, you could stretch this to any place in the, in the world. Yes. We hear it a lot in the United States. Yes. Um, that uh, Americans know what's best for them, and it's not the position of the uh, East Coast elites to tell the people what they ought to know and to filter the news the way the elites think that the common people ought to yes. absorb it. So there are these kind of conflicting dynamics. Yes. And, and um, what serves democracy? Is it really to hear what the people want and to say, well, look, this is what really people are looking for, and in a democracy, the right. people get to choose? Or is it a well-informed democracy it has to be well-informed, Right. or they can't make reasonable decisions, so we, the decision maker, the arbiters of what's newsworthy, yes. are going to give them that information. Yes. It seems tough to reconcile that. It is and it is not. So I would start by replacing the word elites with experts. Journalists are not an elite necessarily, they're experts, experts in a particular subject matter. They usually you have political journalists, sports journalists, mm. you know, entertainment journalists, etc. So they know that subject matter much better than most of the population. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the physician knows the functioning of the body much better than the rest of the population. In the same way that a sports coach knows, right, mm -hmm. uh, th how the sport, that particular sport is played much better than the average person. So we all benefit by having experts, right? So there is no reason not to draw from the expertise of the journalists. It is true that sometimes journalists, like all kinds of experts, it's not just about journalists, they tend to operate in a somewhat closed environment in which they only talk to each other and they lose touch with the common person. Mm -hmm. So what the new media, going back to the beginning of the conversation, has been particularly good at right, is, a, is bringing you know, the perspective of the common person to the center of journalistic practice and journalistic decision making of how the news is made. Is it through this, the interactivity of It's through the interactivity right? and through all of these technologies that journalists now have that allow them to see what the public is clicking on. Because every mm -hmm. time we click on a news story, that is recorded by the site, right? Every time we send an email, you know, we send, you know, one particular story to a friend. Mm -hmm. through the site, that is recorded. Every time we post a comment on a new site, that is recorded well, as survey, well. survey, whatever. Exactly. So journalists and media organizations have this information at their, their disposal. So it is to their advantage to try to combine and reconcile the taste and perspective of the public, now that they know much more than before, mm -hmm. with what they know is important for the public and for society at large. So I don't think it's an either or. Mm -hmm. Right? I think it is possible to reconcile them, but it is, it's going to need a lot of creativity and probably a different perspective on the profession and the role of the profession on uh, society. Well, how will um, society change then? Uh, as, in fact, we mentioned before the show in um, your new book, which is, in fact, we'll even hold this up so okay. people can see it. <laughs> this is uh, News at Work, information, Imitation in an Age of Information Abundance. There we go. Um, so we mentioned before the show that, that there are consequences to this, this feedback cycle. And Correct. one of them appears to be that um, the concentration on particular stories seems to be increasing. Correct. So that there are um, fewer stories, even though there are many more outlets. Correct. So how is that happening? Why is that happening? So just to illustrate this so that it doesn't become so abstract, um, there was, for instance, a study done by the Pew Center mm -hmm. uh, in 2009, where for one week, I believe in the month of June of 2009, they gathered all the local news stories that were published in the city of Baltimore, about the city of Baltimore and the surrounding areas. From every source they could from find. From every source they could find. From the largest local newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, to a tiny blog that mm -hmm. had some news. Mm -hmm. And these were several hundred news items, and one of the analyses they conducted was to try to see for every story whether the story had original content or not, that is, had content that had not been published or broadcasted or disseminated in any way, shape, or form elsewhere. And what they found, if my memory is correct, is that 82% of the stories had no original content whatsoever. 
82%. 82%. Had no original content. Had no original content whatsoever. The study is publicly available on the web, so any mm -hmm. uh, yes, viewer we can, we can actually can download it. That. Yes. Right. Um, the beauty of the interactive media, right? It's the beauty of interactive media. So that's what I mean in this book by a tremendous decrease in the diversity of information mm -hmm. that we have available. And in, sometimes in some sort of public talks, um, I have used the analogy of McDonald's, right? Uh, a million sites, I don't know how many you know, restaurants the McDonald's franchise owns in the States, but there are many, 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 right? Yes. Many options for the public in which you always get the same. So you know, chicken nuggets in Chicago are the same as chicken nuggets in Indianapolis, are the same as chicken nuggets in Boston, and actually even in my hometown of Buenos Aires, Argentina, which <laughs> is more than 5,000 miles south. I was going to say even in Moscow. <laughs> even in Moscow, yes. Are the same. With the right. sweet and sour sauce, yes. 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 So the, the news has become on the web and across platforms actually more and more commodify them more and more a commodity, something that has nothing new that you find it in from one store to the next, like McDonald's. So the how, is, how is that serving? If that's true, and I, I accept the fact that it is, if that's true, then how is that serving the public? And we come back to this idea of the experts who are trying to right. get the right information out and listening to the public in order to respond to what's right. coming. And yet we're seeing, if anything, we're seeing a movement in the opposite direction Correct. of what would benefit the public Correct. Most. So. In the book, I argue that this is for the most part a disservice to the public and to society. Mm -hmm. There is one particular aspect that is potentially positive that has to do with the fact that if all the outlets, for the most part, carry the same stories and with somewhat similar perspectives, you know, there are differences, but even in terms of perspectives, there, there is sort of a, a convergence. Um, that means that there is more unity in the public's conversation. Mm -hmm. That is, however, not necessarily true because what we see is that there is a strong usually division between the right and the left or mm -hmm. conservatives and liberals. Right. So it is within the conservative sphere that we have, when we talk about politics, mm -hmm. we have this convergence of perspectives and within the liberal sphere. But for the most part in the book that I argue that setting aside this potential benefit, what we see is a disservice um, to society in many ways. One of the greatest contributions that the media industry makes to society at large has to do with the provision of a diversity of viewpoints and stories and facts, mm -hmm. right? So that the public can be informed about the wide array of things. And that information then allows people to deliberate in a recent fashion and then to vote and act politically accordingly. Now, let me stop you there for a second because yes. something that, that you just said about, about facts. Uh, a phenomenon that we've seen recently is the, the um, uh, what they call fact-free zones and when those who would disparage yes. them. But uh, a, a less concern with facts. In fact, just recently, Senator John Kyle, uh, in an argument in Congress about Planned Parenthood, said mm -hmm. that uh, either 90 or 98 percent of Planned Parenthood funding went to abortions when, in fact, it was three percent of the funds mm -hmm. were used for abortions. And later on his website, there was just a simple disclaimer that said, well, he wasn't making that as a factual statement. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be something that has, that, that trend, and, and, and there are others. For yes. example, um, Fox News was showing uh, during the recent um, protest in, in Wisconsin about mm -hmm. the labor unions, mm -hmm. um, Fox News was talking about the, the protest and in the background, they're showing video of a violent protest that happened in a different time in a different city. Right. Correct. Not, and yes. it's just showing it with no comment about it. Yes. So there's that conscious uh, skewing of facts that seems to have come hand in hand with this growth of digital media. Is there a connection? There is potentially a connection. There is a, a much larger split between fact or factual information and opinion and commentary that what it used to be in the past. And usually when it comes to news, the newer media like blogs or sites like that, for the most part, do not carry new facts. They carry commentary. Mm -hmm. So usually traditional media, old media, mm -hmm. are the machines that provides, still provide us the facts or the factual information that mm -hmm. then the newer media comment on. Um, and I think there might be uh, this sort of trend towards, uh, it's not necessarily fact-free zones, but a, a derision about the facts and about the value of facts mm -hmm. might be associated in part with uh, the rise of certain practices related 
to the media space. That have been made possible by the fact that there's this explosion of new channels to get media out. Is it, is it, would it have been less likely, say, in the old, yes. the old television world of three major networks, it would have yes. been harder to do that, right? Be because in the old world, we had much less choice in terms of what to read mm -hmm. or what to watch. So usually those programs, you know, Walter Cronkite, you know, as the icon of that, would show us a spectrum of content and a spectrum of opinions. And we couldn't just look at or watch what we were interested in and not pay attention to the rest. And the same with the newspaper. But in the newer media, with cable television in particular, with the millions of websites available, we can actually only go to the websites that speak to us, as opposed to the websites that speak to people who are unlike us. So we have what a colleague of mine at Princeton, Marcus Pryor, uh, calls a, a high choice media environment. And when people can choose among a wide variety of options, they choose sites or perspectives or media that talk to them, right? Talk to their preferences, mm -hmm. right? And uh, give them the content that they are comfortable with and the perspectives that they're comfortable with and lay the rest aside. And the world, as we know, is far more complex than the things that we necessarily <laughs> like. So in, the, in that way, it is one possible mechanism for this contribution of the newer media environment toward not necessarily fact-free zones, but, but a, a, a split between factual information and commentary and people not understanding that they're, when they're actually presenting commentary, it's not facts and vice versa. So if, if we look at the, um, this division, and particularly mm -hmm. this self-selection that you've described, yes. that people will gravitate towards the things that reinforce mm -hmm. the way they feel. Um, if that's a natural tendency, which I think it probably mm -hmm. is amongst most people, yes, uh, that can lead you down a very slippery path. And if we talk, we hear a lot about what they call the echo chamber, and that could yes. be on the right or the left, yes. that you hear the reinforcing facts that only cement your already yes. formed opinions. Um, how does that get bridged in this era of unlimited choice where you can self-select? Yes. How do you get exposed, or how can the media, <laughs> the media experts, uh, build something that will allow people uh, who aren't willing to say, well, I, gee, I need to subscribe to you know, The Nation and Newsmax mm -hmm. at the same time to see the mm -hmm. two right and left. How can you bridge that gap? And, and, and it, because you have to bridge that to get a truly informed public. So how do you do that? Correct. It's becoming increasingly difficult. That's the, that's the answer. I you mean, don't have the magic wand you can wave now? I don't have the magic wand. Unfortunately, yeah. it's yeah. becoming increasingly difficult. And you see that in the behavior of the public, for instance, in election times. Mm -hmm. um, so in one of the studies that we conducted at Northwestern, we uh, measure the interest of the public in political news, both in Fox and CNN, during the 2008 electoral cycle, same, sort of around the same time, so in the fall in 09, when not much was happening, and then same days in the fall in 2010, just happened, right, during the midterms. And for instance, during that period, uh, for Fox News on the internet, foxnews.com, mm -hmm. uh, during the 2008 electoral cycle, the public was largely, dramatically uninterested in content having to do with politics. Dramatically uninterested. And then, and the public in CNN was comparatively much more interest. Then, because the candidate right, that spoke to the, peop the, right. the viewers of CNN and the, you know, the users of CNN.com mm -hmm. uh, was winning, right? And you know, the, the other phenomenon was happening with the candidate that spoke to the Fox at, in, at in Fox News. In 2008, but, 2000, but not in 2010. So in 2010, the tendency reversed. So people mm. who were actually looking at news on Fox, on the internet, and right, the Fox News mm -hmm. website, were far more interested in politics because they were winning, because the coverage spoke to them, and conversely, interest in CNN went down. Inter it's just like sports. If it is just is winning, exactly. Many more people so, what that tells you is that it is very difficult to reconcile, it's very difficult to walk down uh, the middle road. And for economic reasons, because media are businesses, you know, in, in some countries they are more heavily subsidized uh, by the government, by the state, than in the US. In the US, they are largely market-driven mm -hmm. organizations. Because they are businesses, they are gonna naturally cater to the interests of the public, right? Sure, sure. So, and so if you have a left and a right, 
and you make money on both. It's very hard to, to walk the middle road. You know, I had a friend many, many years ago who used to say that people walk on both sides of the street. If they walk on the middle of the road, <laughs> yes, cars they get run. Hit by a car. Exactly. Right. So that is in part what is happening with the phenomena, twin phenomena of polarization of perspectives, and also what you refer to as sort of the echo chamber. But there are there are some uh, other uh, trends, though. There are sites on the internet. I think what factcheck.org. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, Politifact. There are sites that that have devoted themselves to trying to. Um, either reinforce or debunk yes. a particular story. Yes. So that is an attempt to, to counter this kind of um, the echo chamber. Yes. But I don't know how much traffic they get and how influential are they. They are influential among the segment of the population who cares about those subjects. But that is a relatively small, comparatively speaking, segment of population. 15 percent, 20 percent maybe. Right? Uh, but the larger segment of population, 80, 85, 75 percent, does not necessarily gravitate towards political content. Right? So they go to a site, they said usually, I don't know, Chicago Tribune, f folks in Chicago, New York Times, mm -hmm. General, etc. They get some information about political news or international affairs, etc. And then they mostly focus on the content that they care about. And they are not going to go, for the most part, to that content. That changes, however, during elections. So during mm, major periods, elections, right? Like major elections, elections correct. Right. Correct. And during periods of major political events like, you know, crisis in mm -hmm. countries, etc. Uh, but for the most part, normally, the average person does not pay a whole lot of attention to political news. So what does that tell us about our democracy and how we make it move forward if the new media seems to be reinforcing the tendency of people not to pay attention to what they really need to know to make right. informed voting right. decisions? Right. So one way in which I think it is uh, going to move forward, if it moves forward in a healthy fashion, is actually by giving the experts enough of a platform Right? Um, because if, so if we think that, so if we imagine that under the normal circumstances, 80% you know, or 70% of the population are going to pay a little bit of attention to political news, but for the most part not. Right? And if that is in part countered by a robust group of experts which can provide information, even though the public might not be interested in, but information that is at hand for those who are interested mm -hmm. and for those who are interested to disseminate some of that information among their friends and family members, at least some of that information will get to people who are not interested in them. So right? a ripple, ripple effect. Is there, oh,